Okay, um, good evening everybody and welcome to the second Labour Friends of the Forces um, event of the year. This is an in conversation event uh, with some of our local government colleagues. Um, I'm Sarah Church, I'm one of the co-chairs of Labour Friends of the Forces. Um, I'm not chairing this evening actually, I'm going to hand over in just a moment uh, to Stephen Morgan MP, our Shadow Minister for the Armed Forces to chair tonight. Um, we will be hearing from um, our local councillor colleagues um, on the panel and then uh, opening up to Q&A. The chat function won't work for you as attendees, but you can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Um, the meeting will be recorded so that we can um, look at it again um, in future and listen to all the excellent sort of tips and reflections that um, uh, our, our panelists have for you this evening. So with that said, I'll hand over to you, Stephen. Sarah, thanks for that introduction and really good to be with you all tonight as the co-chair of Labour Friends of Forces. Some of us were on a call earlier today with John Healy, my boss, and it was a great way to demonstrate what uh, Labour councillors and candidates are already doing across the country for personnel, veterans and their families. It was just an hour meeting earlier today and we ran out of time with lots of people sharing ideas and views around what we're doing as armed forces champions across the uh, country. So that was a really good session. We've got the best of local government this evening uh, representing all parts of the country. We've got Councils Owen Pritchard, Alistair Ross, Nadia Martin and Andy Newman. They're going to introduce themselves but I will just briefly say who they are and what uh, local authorities they represent. More important than ever, I think, do we need to be connecting and working with local government. If we are going to return a Labour government in a few years' time, the path back to power is via lo local government. So we've got really important local elections this year, and it's really good tonight to be hearing from councillors that live and breathe that day in, day out, and do tremendous things in our community. So without further ado, I want to introduce councillor Owen Pritchard, who's deputy leader of Merton Council. Um, thank you very much. Uh, first thing I need to do is... A Apologise if my accent's stronger than usual this evening. I've just had a brace fitted, so generally everything sounds very clearly after about 30 seconds. So please bear with me. Um, I also want to thank for the invite to speak this evening. Um, and actually, thank you for all, everyone involved in Labour Friends of the Forces. There's been a couple of uh, articles over recent days and weeks about concepts of sort of performative patriotism that have uh, mentioned Labour Friends of Forces. And having been around this organisation for a number of years, I can honestly say hand on heart, last year with Stephen and Sarah as chairing, the organisation has really got to the important stuff. It's been non-factional, it's focused on campaigns and focused on policies um, and the things that really matter to veterans. Um, and I applaud them for that and for everyone that I know, some people in the audience um, that are involved in it. Um, I'm just going to touch on a few things of context. Uh, local government, austerity, veterans, um, and government legislation. Um, not all of you will know, but there's many different types of local government within England, three different types, counties, districts, single tiers. Uh, without going into the detail of them, the different ones provide different services, but the key thing is they provide a number of essential services. Education and SEND, nurseries sometimes in some cases, adult social care, mental health, the training and reskilling, housing, all of these fall under this, the remit of councils. These are services that are critical to everyone, and they've been incre hit incredibly hard by austerity. Over the last 10 years, we've seen over 50% cut from government central grant, and that's had a huge impact on what councils can do under and the services the residents have. They've effectively devolved austerity, and this has accompanied the 36 billion cut in the welfare state. So this has caused an increased reliance on regressive and outdated taxes, such as business rates and council tax, for councils to get by. They've also seen them rely on other revenue streams where new risks are taken. And for the first time in a number of years, not, not including Northampton, which was Conservative level a couple of years ago, we're now dealing with mass bank, uh, the, the potential mass bankruptcies. Compare this to a year ago where the central government NHS was all the debts were written off and you can't help but feel that local government is being left out on its own in the cold. Now to speak about veterans slightly, it's important to realise we are 3% of the voting population of the working age population, 
By 2028, there'll be about 1.6 million people. When you include kids and parents within the uh, and partners within the armed forces community, you're touching closer to 5%. That's a considerable mass that we're talking about. Although we don't know exactly, and I'll come onto this data issue, we come generally from a CTUD background, and very often lots of people return to a CTUD background, right? They also predominantly come from the towns and villages um, within the regions. Lots of, you know, that's important for labor, but important for the wider community, because there's lots of talk of leveling up or whatever euphemism you want to use for these areas that have kind of been left behind over the last decade. Um, it's also unique, being a veteran is unique, because no other area of work does four years of work help define your identity four decades later, okay? That's what a veteran is. You do four years in your twenties, four decades later, you still call yourself a veteran and you do it with a fair bit of pride. We also know that we as a community have specific needs and specific problems, um, but we are just Joe Public. So how has the government dealt with that? Well. To be honest, we've seen government legislation and initiatives. Um, these include Armed Forces Act 2011, Beckham Strategy 2018, SDSR talked about it in 2015, Armed Forces Covenant Fund, Aged Veterans Fund, Veterans Gate Gateway. But to steal the words of a member of the audience, these largely are press releases masquerading as bills. Three things inhibit them. First, and I know Stephen has actually wrote about this not just last week. One is they don't put a legal responsibility onto the councils to meet these needs. It's all like shoulda, woulda, coulda. They don't give the councils the resources to meet these needs. And also they don't get the data so that we really understand those needs. Now to touch on very quickly on the three questions. The impact of the cuts, and I'm just gonna go with them. Housing, right? We all know housing is a massive issue in this country. So we know that there's been an 88% fall in new socially rented homes since 2010. Um, and this impacts upon absolutely everybody, including veterans. In 2019, we saw a consultation on the matter. And in 2020, we saw a perfect example of the sort of language to which we're referring, which is they said that councils are strongly encouraged to exempt veterans from local connections priorities. No mandation, no resources. Okay, I'm not asking for us to be given a priority, I'm just asking for us the obstacles to be moved away. Similar with rough sleeping, 6%, that's twice as likely to be a rough sleeper if you're a veteran. We know we can bring people in, we've seen it during COVID, but yet prior to COVID, it was only 1% of people. Where it gets slightly murkier is with education and health impacts. We just don't have the data to know what we need. And we do know circumstantially that we rely on mental health and addiction issues. We also know circumstantially that uh, uh, veterans access send uh, education for their children less frequently, but we don't have the data. So to close, I'm just gonna hit on the final two questions of how to reach um, and serve these communities and suggestions for the party in one go. And that is first represent, empathize, understand, and inform. Do not wear veterans as a badge like the Tories do the NHS. That's the absolute headline. Second, in or out of power, do the research. Find out the data, who, when, what, why. Garrison towns, veterans, spouses, counselors, let alone children cohorts, all need to be studied and looked at. Number three, do not set one section of society against another. Politics of paucity is absolutely toxic. Veterans are not asking for special treatment, just understanding of their conditions. And more than anything, we need the same services. And finally, the same things apply to us. We need the same services. We need the Labour government to tackle poverty, to reduce inequality, to improve security in all its forms, from social security to health security to national security, and to empower our communities. We get those things right, right, and you won't go far wrong with anyone, as well as veterans. Thank you. Owen, thank you ever so much. A really excellent contribution to open and really good advice there. Thank you for that. We're going to move eastward across the country now and bring in Alastair Ross from Ipswich Borough Council. Alastair. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Um, well, follow that. I just knew I should have gone first. Um, I, I will try and not go on to the same points as Owen and and maybe add add a bit to it. Um, I, I think he's totally right to focus on the funding cuts 
uh, that have gone to local authorities. And one of the things that a lot of councils who have tried to help veterans and those leaving the forces quite recently is on housing. But when housing has been hit so hard and so many people are really wishing to get into local authority housing, it becomes difficult and you'll even have battles with your own other councillors. For instance, in Ipswich, we have one of the biggest housing stocks in the east of England, and we still have thousands on the waiting list. You know, 262 urgent just for a um, two bedroom flat. So for a veteran to come in, there will be people pushing back on that. And as I think quite clearly Owen said, veterans do not want to be treated you know, as a super special case, they just want to be given, you know, be put back on the ladder in a place they would have been if they had stayed there in the, in the whole time they'd been there rather than being moving around the country or, or abroad and so on. So it's important that we get that right. And I, I think I'm trying to focus on that point that Owen said about veterans not wanting to be treated as special. You will have, and the Conservatives are quite good at it, shouting veterans should be treated as super special cases and you'll have other people on the doorstep saying the same often they may have some link to the veterans they may be family of um they may be distant relatives of or may you know have served one year 20 odd years ago and their views on veterans be very different to the majority of veterans who either have done four years up to 22 years their views will be very different uh, as, as Owen said, they don't want to be uh, treated as special. And often when you help a veteran, if you try and, as often politicians do, get any publicity out of it, the veteran's very loath to, to want to do that. They don't want to be treated as that sort of special cases. That They want to be treated as normal. One way of getting the veterans back on our side, and, and we mentioned it in the meeting that Stephen mentioned this afternoon, you know, there's no doubt a lot of the veteran community or those associated, as Owen quite clearly said, when you add all families on, it's 5% of the of the voters by 2028. We have got a big battle to get Labour to be seen as their friend. And one of the ways of doing that is actually how we interact with the serving soldiers and Navy and Airmen. So that's quite important in garrison towns. Uh, but even as a local authority, most largest towns will have some sort of reserve um, unit within their town. That's quite easy for an LA, you know, for a councillor to get hold of them, go and meet them one evening, you know, when they're on their training nights or drill nights, as they call them, and that's a good way. It was noticeable today at the meeting earlier how few local authorities or champions knew that quite a few councils are already um, what we call... Um, top employers are reserve soldiers. Very, very few knew, because it's normally just an officer job, fills the form in, gets the RFCA, the, you know, the Reserve Association's Merit Award for being a good employer. And you'll find there are a number of military uh, veterans and reservists within your own organisation as a local authority. And you don't even, you aren't even aware of them, you know, and it's, and when you need to, when you find them and you, you realise straight away, you as a counsellor, and that veteran or reservist, you've already got a link. Your relationship becomes very different to normal counsellor officer, and you'll get more out of it, and you can find out. So actually looking after your own employees who are veterans or reservists is a good start. And one thing you can look to do, um, which I don't think is treating them as a super special case, but is to make sure that any veteran who applies for a job gets an interview. You know, it's not that a difficult task. and. For those of us and most of us here on, on this meeting tonight will be veterans or friends of the armed forces. You know, veterans can do you a very good job. You know, we mentioned again, I mentioned about rough sleepers. The person we have in charge of looking for rough sleepers and helping you in Ipswich, I didn't actually really, I went out with him one night when we do our, do the um, census at two in the morning. So one of the reasons why I went is I wanted to see how many, if, if were veterans, the only veteran I met was actually him, who was running it. <laughs> who was, you know, again, a 22 year, 22 years in the army, great as a star major, and you know, he wanted to commit back. You know, he wanted to do a job that he thought was beneficial, and there he was looking after rough sleepers. So there is important things there. So 
the question number two about how you can um, get in with your communities it's very different depending if you're a town which is a garrison town Colchester, Catrick or Aldershot or if you're a town which has no military um, units nearby but there will be links whether it's the reservists to get hold of veterans again is difficult it will be on the census I believe the next census but it is still quite difficult but there are ways around it and in you breakfast clubs and you'll find that actually quite a few councils are already running them but you're just not aware of them. So it's good. One of the things that came up, the last thing to point out I make is we mentioned, it was mentioned this afternoon, that on the doorstep, and John Healy mentioned it himself, if you went to the doorstep, there was a poppy or help for heroes, that you were, some politicians were expecting a frost, frosty approach in 2019. That That is what I found as well. Interestingly, as soon as you went to the door and said you're a veteran yourself, they believed everything you said. It was almost as if that had gone, oh, you're a veteran. So it's important that when you have veterans, that you are out there campaigning because people will believe you and you're the easiest person to say, don't believe what you're reading the paper. This is what we're doing because you can sell the story far better than any other councillor. That's it. Thank you. Alistair, very good. Thanks for that. Really good ad advice again. Practical ideas there in terms of the importance of engaging with communities, getting involved with understanding what reservists are doing and really good examples of employment schemes across the country. We're going to move to my neck of the woods now, the southeast. It's great to have Nadia Martin with us, who's a councillor in Rushmore. Hi, um, thanks for inviting me on the panel tonight. Um, I'm not just a councillor, but I'm also an army wife. So my husband's in the Scots Guards and I thought tonight I'd talk about um, housing. I could talk about um, the issues of getting our children into a local school or health inequalities when families are posted to a new area. Uh, but I hope that my experience of living in army quarters for the last 15 years will give you an insight to what it's like for military families and also some of the work that I've done around this since uh, becoming a counsellor. Um, so on Monday, the MP for Leeds Northwest, Alex Sobo, referred to um, my survey I had done in Aldershot with families living in service family accommodation. The survey was based on Army's, uh, Amy's maintenance and repairs performance, and um, 66 of those um, that did the survey said that their homes were not in full work and order at Martin. 69% said that faults had to be reported every quarter. 60% said that the workmen either did not turn up or the wrong workman turned up. And 68% said they had to call Amy back because the job was done inadequately the first time around. Um, as a result of this, I got our registered providers at the council to call in the Defence Infrastructure Organisation so they could be scrutinised on the work Amy were doing. Unfortunately, on paper, it didn't look like Amy were doing a bad job and that's because not everyone escalates the problems to the complaints department, but this would be recorded. Um, from my experience, when I reported a faulty sliding wardrobe door to them on, on a Friday, um, they told me it wasn't an emergency, although I had told them it was hanging on by one nail in the corner. Um, I didn't know at the time, but it was put in a letter to me after I had raised the stage four complaint that the reason it was not booked in from an emergency appointment was because I said I could not remove it. And it wasn't because it was sturdy, it was because I physically couldn't lift the doors off. And my husband wasn't here to help, so it was just me. Um, anyway, they booked me an appointment for the Wednesday. And on the Monday night, the, um, my son got up to use the bathroom and the, the doors fell. Um, they hit his head, they scratched his finger and they smashed his TV. So. The Wednesday came and um, the repairman told me that it could just botch it up and no one would know because I wasn't getting new doors. And I told him I wasn't having that. And um, he said, the only option you have is to put your doors in the garage. When you move out of this house, ring us back up and we'll put the doors back on the wardrobe. So um, that's a hazard for the next family that's going to move into this house whenever we leave. Um, I did raise a complaint and nothing came of it. So I think it's a hassle for most families to do this and time consuming when they raise these complaints, especially when no action is taken. Um, I also had six leaks in my ceiling last year 
as they didn't secure the pipes in the bathroom after they had fitted new taps. Um, my house was dirty when I moved in. We couldn't unpack until we gave it a deep clean ourselves. We have cupboards in the kitchen that are missing. And um, when they did remove the bath, we found 40 crisp packets and other rubbish under there from 2011. Um, but my experience compared to others are minor. And I know um, a child fell from a bedroom window a few years ago because the safety latches had been removed um, and others are left without hot water for months and months. So my recommendation after the survey was that the way to report any work that needs doing would be to have an app, an app where occupants could upload a photo and write a few words about the fault they were reporting. I also recommended that a follow-up should take place two to three months after the repair um, because so many of us have to report the same faults over and over again. Um, so I would like to see councils all over take more of an active role in holding um, DIO to account on their contractors. And at Rushmore, our housing department will get involved in helping army families. I did ask that question and they said they would call Amy on behalf of the occupants if, if they fail to carry out the work. Um, but I know it's not common knowledge with army families that move into Aldershot. And I mostly use social media to communicate with service families. And if anyone raises an issue locally, I tell them that um, they can contact the, house, the housing department at the council. Uh, but there's also a Facebook page called Victims of Carillion Amy, and that was created four years ago and has over 4,000 4, members. So this is where people tend to seek advice regardless of where they live in the country. Um, and it's a good page to see what families have to put up with. Um, in terms of connecting with um, army families, last year I held a cops and coffee morning at our local library after the estates were targeted by burglars. Um, and I had planned to organize um, more like cops and coffee mornings, but replace the cops with someone from the council, or someone with the citizens advice bureau and just reach out to all the different welfares and get these people in um, to talk about how they can help um, or what what services are available for the um, families and the veterans in the area. So I think social media is really powerful because when I moved to the area, I did join the Labour Party when I moved here and the leader at the time, he did reach out to me over Facebook and ask me to join. Um, come to the next branch meeting and I thought I'd give it a go and I had planned on turning up once and here I am because I thought I can achieve so much for the families and yeah now I'm a counsellor and it's taken a long time I think because it's a bit complicated I feel to get to get um to hold Amy to account even when I email them about an issue they're trying to pass it on to different people so but I think we'll get there. And I think reaching out to them over social media, joining the local, um, every, every area that has service people has, has, has a, a local page and ours is called Swags of Aldershot, but you might get Wags, Wags of Portsmouth, for example. Um, and I just encourage people to join these pages or try and join them and look out for any issues that they can help with that no one picks up because families feel isolated when they when they move you know they have no they have no family around them and they rely on people like us who care about them to um, be there and support them and point them in the right direction so yeah that's it Nadia absolutely fantastic and I think actually everyone on this call uh, absolutely agrees with every word that you've said and, and I mean what you're doing is what we should all be doing across the country. So thank you for what you are doing. What an inspiration. And, and so timely in terms of that survey to feed into uh, the Armed Forces Bill that we're now debating in Parliament and obviously that really important National Audit Office report that came out last week. So I will certainly be emailing you and pitching that idea of cops, yes. cops and coffee or whatever you call it. Oh, it was actually um, some of my ward councillors set that up and I pinched their idea. But... We're all one party, so. Really a practical way to engage people. I do. Yes, it is. Me, but maybe I ought to go for coffee instead in future. Okay, so finally, folks, we've got Andy Newman from North Tyneside. Over to Andy. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, first, I just want to thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. And I, I suppose what I want to speak to is, is the big question for the party is uh, how do we re-engage with the veterans community? Um, in, in my view, there, there's two ways. Uh, uh, the first one is having more veterans and people from the armed forces community involved in national and local politics. But secondly, to develop good quality veteran services at a local level from uh, labor controlled authorities. And that's pretty much what I wanted to speak to tonight on, on this. Uh, firstly, and I know these points have more or less been covered, but uh, I think it's really important that we're, while we talk about the issue surrounding our armed forces community, that we need to be mindful that we don't see them in isolation. Uh, for example, like a, what I want to say about this is just say we're talking about veterans' mental health. Part of the issue around veterans' mental health is that the Conservative government has constantly underfunded mental health provisions. If we want to talk about housing, I know housing has come up quite a lot tonight, and it's a, a particular passion of mine. Um, if we're trying to talk about good quality housing for our veterans, part of the issue is that there is a lack of good quality housing at a local level and the Tories have constantly ignored this situation for a, as long as they've been in power. So I think it's important that we, we remember that. Uh, starting with austerity because it frames everything, it's, it's framed everything at the local authority for the past 10 years and to give you a bit of a, a scale of the, the situation, North Tyneside, which isn't the biggest borough in the country, has had to make over £120 million pounds of efficiency savings, uh, which isn't insignificant, it's, it's quite significant. And uh, this means trying to provide just normal services day to day is becoming very challenging every year. Uh, this is the same for all local authorities. And in my opinion, I think it's sort of led to a reluctance within local authority to invest in areas where they would see as a non-statutory responsibility. If we add to this situation, the Armed Forces Covenant, uh, which I'm very critical of, which I'm pretty sure most veterans are critical of. And, and it's been pointed out already that the Armed Forces Covenant, whilst it commits local authorities to make sure that our veterans don't face any sort of disadvantages because of their services, uh, so, so their service, it doesn't actually commit any local authority to any minimum level of service. So what you essentially end up with is, is a postcode lottery with some local authorities, unfortunately, given the bare minimum service that's out there. Um, and I, 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 you can't be blamed when you've got this level of austerity. That's naturally what the result of that austerity is going to be. And that's why I'm of the opinion that the Armed Forces Covenant is little more than Tory party propaganda designed solely to divert attention and blame from central government down to the local level. Um, and I think we always need to highlight that fact. Now, even though we've got austerity, it, it doesn't mean that there is nothing local authorities can actually do. Um, there's actually, since I became ele elected, I was quite lucky that we had a, an armed forces champion, Gary Bell, and an elected mayor, Norma Redfern, who were very passionate about using the existing powers of local authorities to try and develop uh, veterans policies. And some of these policies don't need any additional powers, don't need any additional funding, and they're very easy to implement, such as what's already been said uh, around enhanced housing offers, around free or exclusive gym memberships. Uh, but North Tyneside, like a, a number of other councils, wanted to try and look into helping out with employment and becoming renowned as a veteran friendly employer. And like a lot of councils, we developed a, a guaranteed interview scheme and then asked our uh, suppliers and partners to to look at this as well, because we all know it's a, a well-known fact that um, part of the issue with service leavers is being able to translate military skills into civilian skills. And we felt by bringing in a guaranteed interview scheme, it would be a practical uh, and effective change. But I think the most important policy we developed uh, was our outreach service. Now, Councillor Gary Bell uh, was really passionate about bringing in a, an outreach service. Now, this one does require funding, so it, it required a little bit of creativity around it. Um, and what we've done is, um, to, basically, we, we hired our own in-house dedicated outreach worker, as opposed to having the outreach service bolted onto the job role of an existing council officer or relying on third party or charity sector to provide outreach services. Uh, in order to secure the funding for this officer, we designated the officer as a specialist housing officer. That's important because we were able to then use the housing revenue account to fund 
the job role instead. And, and, and by doing this, it means we didn't put any additional pressure onto another department. So it was very easy to pass through the council. So it did take, take a bit of creativity. Now, the main advantage of this um, outreach officer is that there is one dedicated point of contact for our veterans and uh, charity sectors who need help. But also that, that outreach worker has the time, the resources, and the basic, basically all, all the help they need to be able to develop networks and uh, tailor solutions for our veterans. So it, it's a, turned out to be an incredibly effective um, role. And it's so effective that our, um, other, the other councils in our area are, are now starting to adopt very similar models to what North Tyneside has done. So I'm, I'm very passionate about this. So passionate, in fact, I would actually suggest that all local authorities at some point should have a dedicated um, outreach officer. Uh, it's something to look into, and I hope the Labour Party do look into trying to, to encourage other uh, Labour authorities to, to do this. The, the very last thing I wanted to very quickly touch on, because I think it is important about developing Labour's reputation with the armed forces, is that as well as looking at policies and uh, roles and initiatives that the local authority can do internally, it also has a role to look externally. Um, I honestly believe that local authority is the collective will of the people that they represent. And local authority will very often lobby government for changes that they think is necessary. And we've done this around pensions, we've done this around trains. And I think there's a very strong case to uh, argue that local authorities should be making or, or lobbying the government for changes to our um, veterans, to support our veterans. And we've seen this very recently with the Help of Commonwealth 8 campaign where we've managed to, I mean, it was Labour Friends of the Forces who pushed the motion to other authorities. And we've had over 28 Labour groups uh, say that they're going to adopt this motion and take it to their council. And it's had an effect because if anybody watched the second reading of the Armed Forces Bill, the amount of MPs who brought up Commonwealth veterans shows that this is working. So I hope as, as Labour Friends of the Forces expands that we continue to utilise local authority in this way. So that's everything I've got to say. I hope you found it beneficial. So thank you very much. Andy, thank you ever so much for that. And I think a really good point there around the need for good quality tailored services, a classic example of a brilliant labor run local authority that's not only just talking the right talk, but then delivering for, for personnel and their veterans. So thanks ever so much for that. So folks, we, we've called this an in-conversation meeting tonight. We're really keen to hear comments, ideas, and views. If you haven't done so already, please do post your comment in the Q&A chat function. But just to sort of summarise some of the key things that have come out, the importance of understanding data, uh, making sure it's not about tokens and badges, but real action, uh, reaching personnel and reservists has been a key theme. Uh, Nadia saying around surveys on key issues and addressing everyday problems. And then I really like what Owen said in terms of it's not about press releases uh, and, and bills, it's about meaningful real actions and I think that falls on all of our shoulders to make sure that we point that out at every opportunity that this government are doing that but also us offer a credible alternative. So well, let's get now into the chat and the Q&A. Uh, Sarah might need your help with some of this but I think we've got a question from Alex Crawford. Okay. Alex yep. So I will ask you to unmute if you have a question you can ask it yourself yeah okay thanks very much uh, sarah uh, thanks Stephen. um i'd be interested to know the views of you uh, the four on the panel as councillors how important do you find it is for your council to work in partnership with local voluntary organizations such as uh, citizens advice and other charities who can support services for veterans and for serving uh, forces. Thank you, Alex. Let's take answers via the route that people spoke in. So, Owen first. This is the downside of speaking first, Hanley. Um, <laughs> no, um, Alex, it's a good point. So, the working with the voluntary sector is massive for um, councils. Um, we have we subsidise the Merton uh, MSVC, so the Merton voluntary sector and charities, um, and it varies from council borough to borough. Some larger, some councils have huge bequeathment to them. Some councils, like ours, have to subsidise it ourselves. Uh, with regards to the type of the council, well, in my area, which is Merton, for those who don't know, that's South London, 
where Wimbledon is, and then uh, in, in the half I live, which is Mitcham. We have Hague Housing, which is the biggest housing for Nepalese community, right? So we do work with Hague, Hague Housing, you know, um, in, in quite a big way. We work with uh, Don's Action Trust for um, food banks and the like. Uh, do we work with charities in other areas specifically for veterans? Probably not as much as we should, but our, because our veterans community outside of Hague Housing is not massive, honest, and we try to approach it through that way. Um, but we're always open to ideas. So if there are specific charities you want to, uh, you suggest we tie into or subsidize, I could put those cases for. Thank you, Owen. Alistair, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, just, I, I think like Owen, we, we in Ipswich invest heavily in the Citizens Advice Bureau. Uh, and interestingly, the Tories, especially the County Council, have made massive cuts in their grant to the CAB. It, it's just common sense for us because if the CAB wasn't there, we would have to probably provide half the services they already do. So, so that's that. Talking about one of the questions I think Alex asked about military charities, that's a lot more difficult. Uh, my personal view, there's far too many of them. Um, and I think someone's already mentioned in one of the other questions I saw written down about the state of the British Legion. It's difficult because in some villages and towns, it is the only thing. In other towns, the late Legion has got nothing to do with the veteran community anymore. Though still probably does a good job. So I think your military charities and links to them is much more difficult to work on. Even if you are a town which hasn't got many military in, like Owen mentioned, Merton, you will some of your soldiers will come from your local regiment. So actually getting a link into their local the charity for the regiment that where you recruit from is quite useful because if someone comes across hard times, homeless, etc., like mentioned earlier, it might be that you can get some help from within that regimental charity. But there are far too many charities and there's some dubious ones that seem to appear every now and then as well. So it's a, it's a bit of a minefield working with military charities at times. Asda, thanks for that. Nadia or Andy, anything you wanted to add to the answers? Um, yeah, so we don't have a, a military charity as such, but we have, um, it's a, a, char a charity called the Vine Centre and they help all sorts of people. And uh, myself and my ward council, we give our councillors grant to, to that because they set up um, help for the veterans, mental health issues finding them work, getting them into work. And um, every year we've been given um, our award grants to that charity because it does help the veterans. And we were looking for um, somewhere this year to give it to um, a charity that helps families, but we couldn't find one locally. So, uh, I mean, the Vine Centre helps everyone. So I suppose that that helps, yeah, the families if they need it, yeah. Thank you for that. Andy, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, well, I think everybody's nailed quite a lot of what I was going to say. But one thing I would like to follow on with this is that um, when you get really good grassroots charities, uh, veterans charities especially, they make the world of difference. There's one charity that I spend a lot of time with, even um, in partnership with Councillor Gary Bell, who is our on force veteran, but I, I, I like to take a keen interest in this charity as well, is we've got a, a charity called Operation Veteran, who's set up by a guy who's ex-RAF. Um, there's a lot of ex-military involved in the charity and the service they provide is just fantastic from beginning to end. And the, go the, the, lo the local government didn't have to do, or the local council didn't have to do much work. We give them a little bit of grant funding to help them get set up. We've helped them with like some premises and trying to get them some funding. But actually having a really strong partnership with a charity like that has made all the difference to uh, our, our veterans. And I'd strongly recommend if you find good grassroots charities which are doing a lot of good work get a hold of them help them develop that relationship because they can make the world a difference thanks that andy next question then is from sophie as counselors how do we engage with military families and veterans obviously nadia covered some of that earlier but sophie did you want to come in on that yes it was just um it was just to find about i know nadia had said about it but if there was any other ways of of engaging with with the community at all any of the panel want to answer that? Owen? Yeah, if I can, and thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Sophie. I think the, the key thing is, is you find them first. So I'm 
you know, I'm an old infant here, so I believe in fine fixed strike, okay? Um, and it's very difficult to fix them and to strike them with all your lines to take. If you if you haven't found them first, I can see Nadia smiling, she's probably heard that in the house before now as well. Um, the, the truth is, we don't know enough about where these people are or how to reach them, be they serving personnel or veterans. Um, we can do more. A lot of what we can do is when we're in power, quite frankly, in, uh, uh, in national government, but it begins when we're out of power with having a better register of what councillors have had armed forces connections, having an intelligence map of where gas and cannons are, where main recruitments are. Those kind of things matter because when you begin to understand the picture, then you can begin to do your stakeholder analysis and begin to understand. So I know that sounds really technical, you know, and when you get to the delivery end, it will look like what Nadia is doing, and not because Nadia is slap bang in the middle of a high density area, but there's a lot of people who aren't in those high density areas, and we've got to find them first. So it's kind of data led. I'm sorry, that sounds a little bit technical. I mean, thanks for that. Alistair, I think you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, it's just, I think when I was, I was knocking on doors a couple of years ago, and a sort of newish block of flats, walked in, you know, again, we've got no military barracks in our town, but two garrisons within sort of 20 miles, knocked on the door, walking around, went to the top floor and noticed all the boots and their shoes were outside the doors, all very neatly. It was like walking around a science mess, not, not the officer's mess because the boots were all in pairs and neat but, and, and polished. But straight away, I realised that they were, these were soldiers living here, knocked on the door, and they've, they've all bought or uh, renting, moved out of the army uh, accommodation. So there I'd found a small batch of serving soldiers living in our town, chatted with them, obviously you, you get that relationship, and found that there was about 15 to 16 on this small new estate, mostly uh, of flats, you know, who decided to live there. So straight away you had a little connection. So, so that is one way. And going back to Andy uh, mentioned earlier, I was probably a bit unfair on some charities. If you get hold of a good charity, especially a small charity, they will have found the veterans or the veterans may have come to them before they've gone to the council. So that's another way of getting in there, getting the trust of that charity, and then you can help and assist the veterans. And then that charity knows that you're a good contact. Thanks, Sir Alistair. Anyone else want to come in? Andy? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say, I mean, the answers have been fantastic already, but if we just quickly add to what they've said, it goes back to what I was saying about our outreach worker. It's getting the outreach service, right? I think if local government can get an, a really strong outreach worker, even this is going into charities, then you can really start to make inroads into the uh, veterans community. And there's two points I want to make with this. And the first one is when it comes to the veterans charities, veterans, Generally speaking, and I know generally because we, we've all, I think we've all had that veteran who was very angry with us, but generally if you're helping, they don't really care if you're Labour or Conservative, they will talk to you. If you're talking to them or helping, they will, they will listen. And there's a lot of veterans in these veterans charities who, for example, are very, I would say, they vote Tory, but have a lot of time for North Tyneside because they can see the work that we're doing. And that's actually starting to filter where more and more people at a local level are starting to say, well, actually, Labour, and it's starting to help us make inroads in that. So getting your good outreach to the veterans, charities is essential. But then our outreach worker does a lot of independent work. And, and a lot of independent work, she just goes out there and she finds military families. She develops those links, to, develop those networks, and she can then feed that into us. And it works. And we, we've got a really good relationship with our, our armed forces community due to those two. Uh, factors. Thanks to Andy. Nadia, anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say social media again. Um, every, every town has has a buy, sell, swap or a rants page. Um, ours is probably the worst. Um, but why, why don't councillors in areas where, where they don't know if there's service family there just set up a group called um, service family and veterans and post it out there and get people to join and then maybe organize coffee mornings or when things are back to normal you can organize days out to a local park or stuff like that just get them get the families together because a lot of my friends have now moved from Aldershot and they've all bought their own houses back in Lancashire and Scotland and Yorkshire they're scattered all over the place so um, I think they miss the army community but if we can get families together I think that would be good, especially if it's coming from 
a labor councillor or MP. <laughs> Nadia, thank you for that. Our good friend James has a question. Do we think it's a good idea for Labour Friends of the Forces to have a visible presence on Armed Forces Day around the country? Chair's prerogative, I'm going to say absolutely yes. So the question to the panel is, what could we do this June for Armed Forces Day that would be meaningful? Who wants to go first? Owen. So I had this conversation very briefly with our Armed Forces champion in my council, Dennis. And I said, look, if we can find a couple of K just to do something, anything, even if it's just three or four people outside the civic centre with a flag, OK? Um, and I also saw about one of James's comments on the chat um, about people not turning up to remember Sunday on Force of Champion. I am, um, look, I left. I was never particularly officer -y when I was in. When I left, I bought myself a new blazer with shiny buttons, greys to go with it, the Reggie tie, and twice a year, I chuck that on and I look the part. I'm cleanly shaven, I get my hair cut, and I know that's what the local British Legion wants to see. That's what the local residents want to see. That's my duty to me, me representing veterans and representing Labour veterans. It's not too much to ask. And for all the nonsense about the criticism about looking smart and taking pride in your flag, right? It took me 20 odd years to take pride in the Union Jack because I believe it, it was, I never really saw it on Welsh flag, but my Clyde Cymru father, right? But it is my flag, right? There's nothing wrong with that. And wearing those things with pride, looking smart on those days are a big part of what we need to do, okay? Thank you. Alistair. Yeah, um, we we run an armed force. And luckily in Suffolk, we share it, and we had our turn last time. Uh, but what we did, which I think because I sort of got involved with it, rather than just invite the usual veterans, and the trouble is it's often those who turn up on Remembrance Day, a small group. I act, and we had the local units came. But what I also did was manage to get hold of our county regiment, the Royal Anglians, who are based in Woolwich, and managed to get them to send two minibuses uh, of lads up who you know, stood on their combats, met the mayor, and then we got the local brewery to give them some free beers afterwards. Because I thought that was more important because actually them soldiers got a long weekend out of it. Their families thought the council had done a brilliant job because they saw their own sons in their town. You know, and to the lads, it wasn't really a chore coming home and giving it Billy Big Boots and their uniform in, in their own town. You know, and they and it, it went well. And interestingly, one of the other councils, not Labour now, are copying the same idea. Uh, well, they were going to, but obviously because of COVID, it's all become a bit of a, a non-event this year. But they were expecting to do the same. So important to think not just your local unit that's based near you, not just the veterans that you already know about, but other veterans groups and your own unit that you recruit from, which, you know, which is... You know, it's, it's a bit easier than you think, really, because it's mainly large county regiments or large regional regiments. And if you said, you know, if you were in somewhere like Coventry or, you know, in Lincoln and you went to your local, they, they would find a minibus of lads to come up and it wouldn't be much of a chore. Thanks, for that, Alistair. Any other ideas from the panel in terms of what Labour Friends of Forces could do on our Forces Day? Andy. Well, I, I, I think the same as you, we need a presence on Armed Forces Day. I've, I don't think there's anything wrong with Labour Friends of the Forces organising events around on Forces Day. And it goes back to, I think Owen said it before, I mean, I, I very rarely done any of my military stuff, but on, on Forces Day and Remembrance Sunday, I get my medals on, my blue, red, blue tie, I go to the event. And it goes back to this, and I think where, where you sit in the party doesn't really matter. I, I personally think it's unfair criticism on Keir Starmer with the flag. When did we lose touch with patriotism? When, when did the left lose patriotism? When did we allow the right to have a monopoly on patriotism? I studied history, and I, I'm a, when I left the army, I went back to the Open University and I studied history. The, the Labour Party has always stood with patriotism. If you look at the 1945 election campaign, there was veterans plastered all over every Labour um, poster. And I know that's going back a long time, and times have changed. But the left itself, the Labour Party, has sort of lost touch with that patriotism and Labour Friends of the Forces, I think will be the driving force to re-engage the left with patriotism. And I would, I, I think any criticism of Labour Friends of the Forces organising chat around um, on Forces Day, um, doing events around, you know, meetups or anything like that, or any type of, you know, whether or not we want to try and get local 
uh, Labour groups involved in anything with Labour Friends of the Force around that day. Any criticism is wrong because we need to re-engage with patriotism and I hope Labour Friends of the Forces will do that. Thank you for that. Andy, now, is there anything else on Armed Forces Day you wanted to add? Um, no, we just uh, always lay a wreath from our Labour Party or Labour branch in Aldershot. Um, but if we can do anything better, I mean, Andy and everyone gives some great ideas there. So I think the more visible we are, um, and it's not for scoring brownie points because that's what we hear all the time, isn't it? It's because we care and we want to remember them and they need to know that we're on their side. So, and it's about paying respect and why should we as Labour councils not, not pay respect or why should it not be genuine? Just because we're in the Labour Party, it is more genuine if anything. Brilliant idea. One of the things I did last year, if helpful as a practical suggestion, is I wrote to all schools in the constituency and asked children to do a, a postcard to a local veteran. And we had some fantastic responses. Then we delivered that to local British Legion to give out to local veterans. So a really sort of practical idea that made a real difference. Let's take a question from Alex Lee. We've obviously touched on the Armed Forces Bill earlier today that was debated in, in Parliament on Monday. Alex, did you want to come in with your question? Hi, Stephen. Uh, thanks very much for, for asking. Uh, Andy touched upon it briefly in his uh, in his statement. I'm just wondering if you, anyone else has any thoughts on the um, Armed Forces Bill that was read on Monday um, and whether the, the covenant going into law will actually provide um, any benefit to, to veterans and armed forces communities across the country and whether it goes far, far enough. Um, and also, whether government will be providing any resources for local councils to um, enact that kind of covenant uh, across the communities that they're involved with. Thank you. Who on the panel wants to answer that? I'm conscious of time, so we might not be able to take everyone. Owen first and Andy. Uh, spot on. I, so I think this links into Tony Wright's question about armed forces champions. Um, Tony, I don't believe that there should be statutory obligation for champions. I believe there should be statutory obligation for DPs, right? And the responsibilities of councils to meet needs or to reduce the obstacles. I believe they need to be resourced and most of the working councils, just the same as everything is done by the officers, not by the, not by the councillors, right? So they need to meet their statutory obligations. That needs to be tied up in the covenant. To answer the question specifically here, no, there is no resources. It wasn't part of the financial settlement, right? If we're going to do this properly, when we're in government, and we will do it properly, there will be rights that um, that uh, veterans and leaving personnel will have. There will be responsibilities placed on councils, and there will be resources allocated to them either in a hypothecated fashion to enable those resources to be met. That's Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I was just going to ask that. Not entirely sure what happened to that. Nadia. I was just saying I could hear you okay. Um, I think you were going to call it in. Was it Alistair? Alistair, sorry. Yeah, I think my screen froze then. Alistair, do you want to answer that question? Uh, not really much to add to really what Owen. The only thing I, when, I, when I left in or, 2002, I don't think anyone knew what the covenant was or that even there was one. Um, Interestingly, I said that at a meet a few years later, and a, a colonel of a, our local one of the regiments based near said, "Oh, every soldier knows it. it. It's become a pain. They're expecting to go into any school they want and wish. So some units, some soldiers are up on it, and then maybe expect too much. And again, it's it's I think about officers getting the resources to do it, and actually knowledge and knowing about it. If it just turns up as one single sheet and loads of sheets of paper about housing, it's just going to sit there." So it, it needs to be short, sharp and enshrined. Thanks for that. Let's try and get through as many of these quickly as possible in the time we've got left. Howard Green asks, there seems to be a big issue for forces personnel to transition to civilian work on leaving the services. Any practical suggestions, comments? I think, Andy, you covered some of that. Anyone else want to raise points on that? All I would say is, I mean, when I left in 2002, I think it, it improved, but I thought it was pretty poor still. And I think that's something that the your team, your shadow defence team, need to look at what what was on offer. And um, 
as a veteran, once you've left, it's changing all the time. So it just needs to make sure that it's good. And you know, and obviously since I left, there was a big improvement on you know education grants and so on. It just needs to make sure that isn't where the quick cuts made and with the regular forces now that they lose that. Andy, then Owen? Yeah, I, I know we've uh, touched on what local authorities can do with uh, guaranteed interviews schemes and such, but I think we need to uh, address the big elephant in the room when it comes to discharges, and that's the uh, careers transition partnership with the military, which is, and this has come from, I, I left the Coliseum Guards back in 2014, and I think it was the biggest waste of time I've ever done. I, I'm, I'm very brutal with the careers transition partnership because I remember that I went to a couple of sessions on, this is what you put on a CV, and then some guy rang us up about three months later and says, what job do you want to do? And then that was it. There was no practical help. There was no support. There was nothing. And I'll give you a bit of an idea. I'm not going to go for that whole conversation, but I'm, it's something that I'm very passionate about because I've, I've got a real problem with the Careers Transition Partnership over this. Um, as I say, I went back to study history at the Open University when I left. So I was already doing something. I was already doing some education. But for my um, when I left for my, for my grant, I did a management course down there and I thought right right I bushy tail young guy just left I thought right I'll, I'll let's see if there's any way I can try and get into that type of type of role and the guy when he rang us up a few months later said oh well I can get your job stuck in shelves and then you can work your way up and I think oh, well that's the point of doing a degree and doing that management course if you want me to stack shelves lo and behold that's essentially what I do because I work in retail because it, especially in the north and this is where I'm sorry I'm going to go for the north-south divide on this one when you look at the, the vastly different um, GDPs of the region, the north is lagged massively. A lot of the veterans come from the north. So not only do you have a massive section of the, the UK, which the GDP is lagging, but you have a high level of veterans who have done a lot of experience with a lot of military courses and then a lot of transitional grants to get courses done, being taught to stack shelves. So we really need to look at the Careers Transition Partnership, and I know this isn't the scope of what we're talking about now, but we really need to look at levelling up the regions, maybe like regional investment banks, because the North is never, ever going to catch up to the South. And one of the biggest issues with this drain is that you get a skill drain from the North to the South, because if you've got good qualifications in the North, the only way of getting a really good job generally is to travel to the South, which means that the only thing you get left with the North is low paid, low skilled jobs. So I think we really need to address that. I'm sorry, I know I've gone off topic slightly, but I think that's one of the areas we need to really look at. Thank you for that, Andy. Owen, I think you wanted to come in. Uh, I agree with everything Andy said, but I will also include Wales and the Southwest and the West Midlands in the areas he's referring to. So um, the I will say two other points, really. One is to do with skills and competencies versus experiences and knowledge okay too many people think they've got to go and work into security or whatever right you don't okay what you've got is a bedrock of basic management and organizational skills and be able to create routine and do things they're transferable anywhere okay so they're the things that are transferable they're the things you need to understand they're the things that you need to be able to write into a cv um, and then a, a more practical one, which could be dealt with through opposition and a private member's bill, um, is enhanced learning credits, right? Is that no one knows what they're going to do the moment they leave. So therefore, veterans need time and a little bit of money, that's 1700 quid a year or whatever it is, to last longer than five years. Uh, it, it, and to be honest, one year is a write-off because of COVID. Now it needs to last longer so that people can reskill. We've talked about through Life Education Service, Angela Rayner spoke well about a couple of years, a uh, uh, couple of a couple of years ago. Uh, but what we can do is facilitate that for veterans now for five years and ten years after they leave to enable them to retrain when they understand better. Owen, thanks for that. I'm really conscious of time, folks. There is a whole set of other comments and questions in the chat, uh, but we have run out of time. Sarah, I know you're still on the call with me. What I would love to do if people are up for this is maybe do a second session where we would share ideas, you know, practical advice and help sort of come up with some campaign ideas. Certainly as we progress as a shadow defence team issues through the Armed Forces Select Committee in the coming weeks. Uh, do people think that would be a useful thing to do? Because I just don't think we've given it justice tonight, an hour, have we, actually? And we had a similar sort of experience 
with a call earlier today with our Armed Forces champion. So if people are up for that, then I, I will take that away as, as an action because I think that's sort of information sharing, the sharing a good practice is something that is really out there for an appetite for at the moment. So if people are up for that, let's do that. On that note, I'll hand back over to Sarah, who I think wants to say a few words. Um, thanks, Stephen. And thank you so much to our panellists. As you say, an hour wasn't long enough. Maybe we, we need to schedule longer and probably more of a round table because I know there are plenty of councillors and candidates in the audience tonight with some excellent questions. In the chat, I have put our email address because um, those questions are really valid and you deserve answers to them and we will do our best to get them answered. And uh, without volunteering any of our panellists for the guardroom, um, if you have questions for them specifically, with regard top tips ideas um, that, that can be put into practice both in opposition and in power at the local level I will endeavour to sort of put you in touch or get those answers from them um, just don't forget I'm serving armed forces communities and Nadia will know this for, half the time forget they've even got local councillors they, they're so busy uh, moving from A to B and worrying who the local welfare officer is that's probably as far as they get and that's who they might use as their local councillor Actually, you reaching out and doing what Nadia has done, which is exceptional, um, is something that would have uh, sort of blown my mind, I think, when I was um, a, both a serving wife and soldier at the same time. Um, so, so, so be that counsellor. It's fantastic. Get in touch with us over email. If you're not signed up to Labour Friends of the Forces, we're labourforces.org. Next event is the 31st of March. However, there's a new one going in the diary uh, to follow up from this one as well. I've recorded this session and we'll put it online. Thanks to everybody all our councillors, all our MPs who are working so hard for the armed forces community. I think it's really heartening for all of us. So thank you for joining tonight. Thank you. Thanks everyone.